Well, now we're into the uh, mangrove zone, as you can see. This is the most seaward extension of the uh, salt marsh. It's slightly different. The, the white mangroves line about a third of the bay's the shore. The, the trees, trees are rather stunted, and it's a surprise to find these usually more tropical plants here at all. But they do serve a purpose. People doing strange things with drain pipes and taking mangrove trees apart have become an accepted facet of life in Westernport. It's been suggested unkindly that perhaps salt marshes and mangroves are only fit for PhDs to rummage in anyway. But there is method in this muddy madness. The main trunk is surrounded by a stubble of special air-breathing roots called pneumatophores, through which oxygen gets down into the tree's vast root system. Locked up in the roots, trunk and leaves of these slow-growing mangroves are a great many foods which could be used by other animals and plants. To measure these nutrients, which include phosphorus and nitrogen, the team is analysing a number of trees. Trunks and leaves are relatively easy to deal with, but only by extracting a mud core can they estimate the amount of root material here. Mangrove roots hold and consolidate the mud. There's a high exchange of nutrients between mud and the trees as the fine roots grow and die, but little gets away to other areas. Unlike sea grass, which dies and feeds the whole bay, mangroves are a food store. Botanist Peter Attiwell shows what this storehouse looks like. Well, this is a fine, silky sediment. It's about a, a metre deep, overlying a very heavy clay. We're at the surface here, the pneumatophores, um, coming up above the sediment surface and well, um, you see it's fairly difficult to pull apart. Uh, there are the fibrous roots there, millions of them. Mud is important here, though it's difficult to work or play in. And some people actually think that if a beach is all mud and not a sand paradise, then the system's gone wrong. The mud is a kind of pollution itself. In fact, this black porridge is mainly a mixed dish of fine sediment and detritus, the rotting remains of the sea grass. And Murray Littlejohn's team have concentrated on investigating the diners who feed on and hide in the food. Yeah, here we are. We've got, we've got, we've got rid of the fine mud and we can now see the animals fairly well. Here's one of the uh, sedentary marine worms, the pterobellid, and it would... Um, trap small particles of detritus on its sticky tentacles. Oh, it messes them, yeah. Yeah, it really is a uh, yeah. quite a fine specimen. Yeah. And the other are uh, animals that come up in abundance in this area are the ghost shrimps that we were talking about before. And yeah. You'll see a lot of those around. There's enormous claw on them again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not sure about its function. It's very interesting, though. It has such an unbalanced set of appendages. Yeah, that's a really big one. Uh-huh, right, yeah. Sentinel crabs as well, uh, they form another important food item for the fishes that move over the yeah. mud flats at high tide. There's an example there. Yeah. Uh, they retreat into these holes all over the surface. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, That's from uh, way out there on the another mud bank, is it? This is in the mud proper, yeah. Ooh. A lot more sea grass. Literally moving in mud, this is slow, laborious work. And like the battalions of soldier crabs, tuned to the tides. Someone said there are more scientists than soldier crabs in Westernport for this study. Sensing the return of the tide, feeding stops, and with either a left or right-handed spin, each crab pirouettes out of sight in its own private igloo. Anything that fails to get its head down as the water seethes back over the mud will be swiftly topped by the toadies. These fish are in the front line of predators ready to gobble up any ghost shrimp caught haunting the surface. Their scientific name is Callionassa, and many end up in a number of different stomachs. Twice each day the line of hungry mouths sweeps in across the mudflats. On a rising tide, the same night fills with fish. A number will be young feeding in this sheltered nursery. Some fish feed along the bottom, 
others in mid-water. Zoologist Dave Nagilski is investigating the variety and number of Western Ports fish. What they take could be found inside, but how and where they feed often shows in their faces. The banjo ray having a, a ventrally situated mouth can only really pick up animals that are directly situated on the bottom and has a crushing type teeth for picking up um, particularly mollusks and shelled animals and can crush them. And now what have we got here? The King, the King George Whiting, um, notice a long conical snout um, which is used mm -hmm. for uh, feeding and uh, digging in the mud in the detritus. Um, he it? actually digs in. No, he actually get put, in his, with a, put his snout down with that conical like snout. Like that, absolutely digging in um, hard and I right. suppose opening the mouth would sort of scatter the mud a bit. Um, probably would and also probably would use um, water and a jetting action and squirting it through the mouth to um, stir it up. I see. And, um, penetrate the mud. Now we've got another bottom feeder here. Yeah, that's a flounder. What are they taking? They tend to feed on things like worms. Uh, worms, Callianassa. This mm -hmm. massive uh, polychaete worm that one gets in the, the mm -hmm. mud, they'd be up above the level of the mud and these chaps just creep along, I suppose, and nip off what they can find. Yes, but that, like a pair of pliers, really, isn't it? Nearly. Yeah, right. Very peculiar shape now. Uh, this is a little, a little flathead. Yeah, they lie right on, right on the bottom, um, virtually buried in the mud. They'll yeah. feed on small fish and uh, invertebrates that p tend to pass over the top. Yeah. Their mouth is pointed upwards. So yes, they yeah. scoop stuff in, I suppose, really, sort of in and Not down. really. No. They'll um, make a clean take. A grab. Um, what, yeah. they, what sort of thing would they take? Uh, they'll take small fish, worms, mollusks, crustaceans. Again, virtually anything. They're pretty spiky, that guy. Yeah, yes. So he's also has very sharp teeth. Yes. <laughs> It would seem wise now, to avoid the, the spiky these, globefish, um, which is blown up with water after being dragged from its seagrass bed. It can give a nasty bite. Yeah. 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 Notice the um, parrot-like uh, teeth, very strong teeth. So chomping up fish, what crustaceans, uh, chomping, uh, yeah. they're chomping right. away with those yes, with the jaws. Strong teeth. Actually, you can't open that uh, banjo ray. Uh, let's have a look and see what we've got inside that. Uh, well, how about that? We've got some crustacea here. Uh, appear to be um, ghost shrimp with the... Um, Pretty well mashed Very large again. snappers again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about all we can see. Is so what's in the mud gets the into the ghost shrimp is, uh, and either passes to the fish or to other links in the food chain. The mud flats are feeding grounds for visiting waders from the northern hemisphere. Black-tailed godwits wait for the change of time to uncover their food. Pelicans, cormorants and terns breed and fish here. At high tide, there's a general pause before the change of shift between fish and birds as the mud slowly reappears. Just how many birds can glean a living from the bay depends on how much area of mud flat there is and the length of time it's exposed. Red neck stints have to race against time, but the red capped dotterel doesn't need to hurry. It feeds above high tide mark. A white ibis can winkle out titbits that those stints could never reach. The range of bill size and shape means each type of bird only feeds on some of what's available. The birds need firm ground to stand on, any softer and these godwits would feed elsewhere. The royal spoonbills, like the ibis and the waders, are feeding by touch, with sensitive beaks. The heron, though, is a quick-eyed feeder. The sea grass that the black swans nibble is sometimes called swan grass, and strangely, they are the largest creatures to graze it. The study is as much concerned with the birds as with the rest of the living network of the bay. To survive, waders like this red-necked stint must feed all the time the mud is exposed. Take away some of the mud, and the birds may not get enough food between tides. Birds use energy moving from mudflat to mudflat, so a change in the available area can be critical. The ornithologists want to find out how Western Port's bird population might change if roosting and feeding areas were reduced. Weight 49. The movements of waders can be followed by marking a number of birds with a harmless die. With about 200 species of bird, Western Port's a popular place for birdos, so there's no shortage of pink-bellied red-necked stint spotters to help the researchers.
One thing I'm sure of, Western Port Bay is not strictly for the birds. The study is broadening all the time. It began with the state government, the universities, industry and consultants combining in a truly cooperative venture, a community of effort to serve a community of needs. Industry will have continuing demands in Western Port, and so will holidaymakers, fishermen, farmers and nature lovers. The demands of the future may be different from those of today, so on this important issue decisions must be made which balance diverse interests and keep options open for the future. Western Port is a bay in the balance. The environmental study won't tip the scales either way, but it will show people what the alternatives are. In the waters of the bay, there are many animals which live in mutual dependence. Under the umbrella of a jellyfish, crustaceans feed and grow in a strange security. And also enjoying the free protection of the jellyfish are two young fish. They too are immune to the stinging tentacles. This delicate balance of interaction is a microcosm of the life in the bay and is a part of the larger network in which we ourselves are enmeshed. The continuing Western Port study should show us how to preserve that balance. For the first time in the world, a bay is being investigated and planned while the options are still open. <laughs>